Government budgets. Government budgets, including both taxes and expenditures, are not records of what has already happened. They are plans or predictions about what is going to happen. But of course, no one really knows what is going to happen, so everything depends on how projections about the future are made. In the United States, the Congressional Budget Office projects tax receipts without fully taking into account how tax rates tend to change economic behavior, and how changed economic behavior then changes tax receipts. For example, the Congressional Budget Office advised Congress that raising the capital gains tax rate from 20% to 28% in 1986 would increase the revenue received from that tax, but in fact, the revenues from this tax fell after the tax rate was raised. Conversely, cuts in the capital gains tax rate in 1978, 97, and 2003 all led to increased revenues from that tax. Undaunted, the Congressional Budget Office estimated that an extension of a temporary reduction in the capital gains tax to 15% would cost the Treasury $20 billion in lost revenues, even though this temporary tax cut had already resulted in tens of billions of dollars in increased revenues. From 2003 through 2007, the disparities between the Congressional Budget Office's estimates of tax receipts were off by growing amounts, underestimating tax receipts by $13 billion in 2003 and by $147 billion in 2007. Many in the media reason the same way the Congressional Budget Office reasons, and are caught by surprise when tax revenues do not follow those beliefs. An unexpectedly steep rise in tax revenues from corporations and the wealthy is driving down the projected budget deficit this year, the New York Times reported in 2006. A year later, the deficit had fallen some more and was now just over 1% of the gross domestic product. Moreover, a growing proportion of all the federal tax revenues came from the highest income earners, despite widespread uses of the phrase, tax cuts for the rich. Back in 1980, when the highest marginal tax rate was 70% on the top income earners, before the series of tax cuts that began in the Reagan administration, 37% of all income tax revenues came from the top 5% of income earners. After a series of tax cuts for the rich over the years had reduced the highest marginal tax rate to 35 percent by 2004, now more than half of all income tax revenues came from the top five percent. Nevertheless, the phrase tax cuts for the rich has continued to flourish in politics and in the media. As Justice Oliver Wendell Holmes once said, catchwords can delay further analysis for 50 years. When it comes to tax policy, such catchwords have delayed analysis even longer. Neither the Congressional Budget Office nor anyone else can predict with certainty the consequences of a given tax rate increase or decrease. It is not just that the exact amount of revenue cannot be predicted. Whether revenue will move in one direction or in the opposite direction is not a foregone conclusion. The choice is among alternative educated guesses, or, what is worse, mechanically calculating how much revenue will come in if no one's behavior changes in the wake of a tax change. Behavior has changed too often and too dramatically to proceed on that assumption. As far back as 1933, John Maynard Keynes observed that taxation may be so high as to defeat its object, and that Given sufficient time to gather the fruits, a reduction of taxation will run a better chance than an increase of balancing the budget. Since budgets are not records of what has already happened, but projections of what is supposed to happen in the future, everything depends on what assumptions are made and by whom. While the Congressional Budget Office issues projections of what future costs and payments are expected to be, the assumptions from which they derive these projections are provided by Congress. If Congress assumes an unrealistically high rate of economic growth, and therefore a far higher intake of tax revenues, the Congressional Budget Office is required to make its projections of future budget deficits or surpluses based on Congress's assumptions, 
whether those assumptions are realistic or unrealistic. The media or the public may treat the Congressional Budget Office's estimates as the product of a nonpartisan group of economists and statisticians, but the assumptions provided by politicians are what ultimately determines the end results. A similar situation exists at the state level, whether the assumptions provided by politicians are about growth rates, rates of return on the government's investments, or any of the many other factors that go into making estimates of the government's finances. When the state of Florida estimated in 2011 how far the money it had set aside to pay its employees' pensions fell short of what was needed to pay those pensions, it proceeded on the arbitrary assumption that it would receive an annual rate of return of 7.75% on the investments it made with that money. But, it, it, but if, in fact, it turned out to receive only 7%, this difference of less than one percentage point would translate into being nearly $14 billion deeper in debt. If Florida received only a 5% rate of return on its investments and the money set aside to pay these pensions, that would produce a shortfall nearly five times what the state officially estimated based on a 7.75% rate of return. Because Florida had in fact received only a 2.6% rate of return on this investment in the previous 10 years, these comparisons show the enormous potential for deception when preparing government budgets simply by changing the arbitrary assumptions on which those budget projections, projections are based. Florida was not unique. As the British magazine The Economist put it, nearly all states apply an optimistic discount rate to their obligations, making the liabilities seem smaller than they are. Among the reasons? Governors and mayors have long offered fat pensions to public servants, thus buying votes today and sending the bill to future taxpayers.